Yes. Okay, um, just a quick introduction. So we have Sylvia and Anna from our team also on the line assisting. I will be moderating today. Can we ask everyone to mute themselves? Okay, so um, it's a specific, it's a very particular webinar as we would like to give the floor first and foremost to our young speakers today. We have participated in a number of webinars in the last few weeks about young people, but very few of those featured young people. Um, we have people calling in from all around the world. We have Argentina, Australia, Uganda, India, France, Italy on the line. Um, not everyone is native English speaker, um, so we, uh, we will take particular care making sure that you understand the questions. Um, we are very pleased that most of you accepted the invitation to participate. I know that for some of you this is the first time to be speaking publicly. Um, it can always be a little bit nerve-wracking, but we're here to support you. Um, I will not take a lot of time introducing each speaker. I will just name them and I will give the floor to them so they can say who they are, what perspective they're representing. Um, they are free to, to speak from the heart. There are no right or wrong answers here. They have received some guiding questions in advance. Um, so without further ado, we are one said, and uh, let's roll with it. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We will make sure that we take care of um, any issues that come up during the webinar. And uh, we'll spend the first half with the young speakers, the second half with what we call the mature speakers. Uh, we have about an hour and a half, so let's get going. And I'd like to call it our first speaker, who is going to be Mercedes from Argentina. Mercedes, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Hello everybody, thanks for joining us today. So I'm on behalf of representing Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's our day 40 of quarantine over here, very early in the morning, around 7 a.m. And so I would like to tell you what's going on a little bit in my country. Uh, for starters, we our numbers are super, super controlled over here, but the measures taken by the government have been very, very strict since the beginning. So the population feels very, the polls go all right with the population. So we are very happy, most of us very happy about the decisions that are being taken to take control of this situation, this extreme situation. We understand about it. Yet we are facing a lot of economical stress, a lot of economical uncertainties. We don't have many, we're not entirely sure about what the plan is. The information is given like in little capsules. We understand this is the way to go in situations such as this one. Yet, the economic efforts from the government and from the state don't seem to cope with the necessities of the country. So, we don't, we not only have 50% of informal, more, more than 50% of informal work is over here in Argentina. So, we're dealing both with people that have literally no, no, no economic um no economic support whatsoever because they haven't been able to be working in a quarantine situation for the last 40 days this is an in the informal situation you need to add up to those entrepreneurs and freelancers that don't have many policies right now working for them and of course we're talking that even the fact that the informal and the informality and the underemployment about in, in argentina I speak of course, it impacts mostly on, on young people, on youth and particularly on young workers who are the first ones to be not disposed, but to be to be affected by these situations because they, they are in more precarious situations. They have uh, less opportunities available. They don't have the maybe the, the needs or the ages or the ages, the years you need for experienced work, too. So they are the first ones to let go in this situation. Therefore, uh, I consider myself, I'm in a privileged situation right now because I have um, a full-time work. I work in the Argentinian industrial organization. So I have the certainty right now as Argentinian that I can go till the end of the month and I'm going to have uh, a money, money to pay my rent, money to pay my things. 
but I understand and I know I'm I'm actually out of my friends like in a minor 30 percent 40 percent um situation where I'm actually I don't I'm not scared about the uncertainty in terms of, of the money that it can be very scary because if you add to the uncertainty of the whole situation the uncertainty of not having money or not being able to produce any money for an extended period of time that we actually don't have much idea how is it going to be because we don't have it, the entire information around us uh it becomes super super tricky to the mind so right now what we're going through is this extreme extreme uh uncertainty about the future as in many countries that are going through this in a culture that's not used to being isolated argentinians are very very social we uh, so friends and family are a big thing over here so it, this cultural change has been massive People are dealing with, we are dealing with loads of depression and anxiety situations right now. The whole of Argentina, uh, trying to keep, trying to deal with it as best as it can. We are still happy about uh, taking all these strict measures to what not, not getting into a, a sanitary emergency. Yet, we have, we don't need to, we cannot leave the economic side and look backwards because it literally affects all of our families. So this is practically day 40. Uh, we were given two days ago, supposedly one hour to go out to have our creation things, but the four biggest places in Argentina, the governors opposed it. So we were given it for like, for a period of 20 hours, we thought we would have it. Now we now have it. So it's our first day of the fourth time they extend quarantine. So every two weeks they say they extend it. So this is a little bit of what's going on here. I think I'm running, uh, I think I'm good with the time, right? Excellent, Mercedes, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for, 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 for sharing a mixture of professional and personal observations. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, Kasha from Australia, the opposite end of the time zone. Um, Kasha, maybe if you could comment a little bit more about how the situation has affected your work and, and schooling situation because I know that your school actually requires quite a lot of physical contact or the, the, the ability to be outside and amongst people. Um, so the floor is yours for the next five minutes, Kasha, off you go. Hey guys, how are you going? Um, thanks for having me, the starters. Uh, it is, what time is it here now? It's eight o'clock at night in Australia. I'm in Melbourne, by the way. Um, so a little bit about my work and schooling experiences well i got i got made redundant relatively early um when the pandemic started i was fortunate enough to be made redundant from my full-time job so i have been luckily left in a financially stable position as of current um it is obviously something that's going to affect me a little bit more later on um but i haven't given it too much thought as of yet since i do have school at the same time so uh i actually i study film at a private academy uh which makes my position a little bit more difficult in terms of studying remotely i do have to do practical work for my schooling so i do require access to professional equipment and editing softwares that i don't currently have um it is still something that i'm able to do remotely they've obviously um made certain allowances for how we complete our assignments unfortunately they can't be made to the standard that the students would prefer so um i do know that my head of faculty has actually made pled a case uh to the school to allow us to come back um for those that will graduate during this time and have access to that equipment later since we are you know, paying quite expensive school fees to be there in the first place. Um, but it is unfortunate for those of us that will move on and won't have the time to come back and make the projects that we were hoping to. Um, you know, we're, we're literally discussing completing graduate projects on our iPhones, if that need be, uh, instead of using red cameras, which, <laughs> which is a camera used to film a lot of the rings. So that gives you an idea of what I'm dealing with now that I'm not actually at school. Um, so that, that part has definitely affected me uh, quite a bit. It's not, it's not a public university, so um, I am going to be out of pocket for a, a, 
a course that I do wish I was probably getting a little bit more out of at this stage, but unfortunately those are the circumstances and I'm still fortunate to be there in general. Um, so that, that part is, is unfortunate and it's unfortunate that I don't get to see my classmates and work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously the film industry is one that's quite hands-on and you do require a lot of cooperation to get your assignments done. You have people in so many different, um, there's so many different areas in completing a film project that's sound and audio, lighting and camera, that to not have the participation of all of your classmates does make it a lot more difficult to complete what you're doing. Um, I'm in the middle of trying to complete a documentary uh, that I'm fortunate enough is based in my suburb that I currently live in. It's a poetic documentary that I can film on the streets on my own when I take my isolated walks. But there are many students that are in a position where they've had to change the narrative of it final year films to fit the circumstances that they find themselves in. So that's probably what's affected me most um, as current. Uh, in terms of in terms of my peers, you know, we're pretty laid back in Australia, but I'd like to think that most of my companions have taken isolation pretty seriously. Uh, from what I've observed, I have many friends um, that do sort of get on top of one another if they if, if they notice that their friends aren't maybe adhering as strictly as they should be, which is great. So I do find that my demographic is adhering pretty strictly for our laid back standards over here. And I have heard of recent that we are starting to flatten the curve, which is great news. Um, but, you know, it, it, it still affects us. Uh, it's probably a little bit more relaxed on our end, but you know, there's obviously some adverse effects when it comes to mental mental health and taking care of yourself at home. So uh, that's definitely, a, I don't know how long I've been talking for now, sorry guys. Um, that's definitely a side that, that I've seen affect more than a few of my friends that I probably wasn't expecting so much. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kasha. It's great to hear from you. It's great to hear especially about how the situation is affecting your ability to finish school and the fact that, as you mentioned, school in Australia, especially when you go to a private one, can be quite costly and, and uh, you will be out of pocket, as you mentioned, you and, and quite a lot of students. Um, thanks for your insights. We're going to move on to Jeffrey from Uganda. Um, different time zone, different continent, a completely different reality. Jeffrey, if you could tell us about how you've been experiencing COVID-19, what is the situation for young people in Uganda? How has your professional life been affected? The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, it's uh, Jerry, not Jeffrey. I don't know if I heard you badly. My mistake. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, Babali, uh, a transport and logistics logistics expert by profession. I have a bachelor's in uh, transport and logistics. I currently work with African Mobilities Observatory. A research project for Michelin, uh, Michelin tires. And uh, yeah, I joined uh, AMO immediately after university as an intern for six months. Uh, that was like in uh, 2017, then uh, promoted to, to be a, a country director. Then uh, referring to the question, mostly here, like uh, the, the young youth, most of us, uh, just like the, the lady from Argentina said, we are social, so this kind of uh, isolation has really impacted us negatively. Like we usually love to meet people, we, we usually meet friends, walk around, talk, and all. But right now in this situation, even yourself, you you kind of fear your friend. You're like, could you be having the virus or something? So it has really uh, negatively impacted us. Then uh, about uh, my work. Uh, I'm to research and research involves me to go to the field. And I, before COVID-19, I, uh, I had interviews, plenty of interviews to meet up with potential uh, directors of different companies. But right now everything is halted. I cannot move to meet anyone. All my work is really like stopped. Yeah? 
I yet I had uh, deadlines to meet, so it has uh, really, really affected me badly. And also, the other people are not willing uh, to do like a video call because some of them are either too busy or some of them are spending much time with their work, with their families. They don't want interaction because majority of the people now, let's say the corporate class, this is now their time to spend with their families. So no one wants to be interrupted with any kind of work. Then other people are under the informal sector and these are like people who don't have access to the internet. So I cannot reach out to them to like carry out like this kind of uh, webinar with them. So it, it has put me down, but uh, I'm hoping for the best, but uh, things will change in time, but I don't know. bit more time Jerry how have you been coping how have you been, what have been your coping mechanisms so how have you been managing the uh, the fact that you cannot see your friends that you cannot spend time outside have you been connecting online have you been more passive more active can you give us a little bit on that okay uh one thing I've uh, discovered in uh, this period is that uh, I'm a very good cook <laughs> delicious meals and better than some people so i've been trying out different different uh cuisines different things they are cooking so in the kitchen I've, I've now mastered it and then uh definitely it has been like passive relations with people to talk try to keep it up with people like at times you are locked up at home after because right now I, I can do some other work that uh, is online for my research so yeah, that can be done. But then in terms of connecting with people, sometimes you, the internet is uh, not good. And yeah, so definitely that, that is all. But the cooking part, um, this period has really helped me to uh, become a better cook. This is excellent, Jerry. Thank you. I think a lot of us have discovered some hidden talents with, with the extra time on our hands. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much for your contribution. What I'll do now is I'll go back to Argentina and I will ask Camila Mirabelli to speak. Uh, Camila is an intern at the Argentinian German Chamber of Commerce. Um, Camila, the floor is yours to tell us about your experience of COVID-19. Hello everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Camila Mirabelli. I am 19 years old and live in Buenos Aires. And at the moment, I am doing a two-year business internship program. Uh, so the situation was easier at first for me. Uh, as Mercedes said, the president ordered mandatory quarantine in Argentina uh, a month and a half ago. Fast enough, so we didn't reach a big number of infected people. And I think staying at home has been our best defense since our health system isn't strong enough to treat lots of infected people at the same time. So I think that's maybe why the president has been so strict about it since the beginning. And that made me feel safer at first. But right now it's getting more difficult because I don't know when I'm, when I'm going to write my exams. I don't even know if I am going to graduate this year as planned or not and no one has an answer <laughs> so what works best for me is not to think about the situation the whole day because i constantly find myself overthinking and getting anxious and when that happens i try to find relief in artistic activities such as painting or listening to music i also like to cook and or just enjoying the simple things like i don't know watching movies <laughs> or having breakfast with no rush and it doesn't have to be something productive because I noticed lately a lot of pressure on social media to accomplish things, learn new skills, uh, a new language. And I mean, we are staying at home in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, being inundated with uh, anxiety inducing news every day. And this pressure to accomplish things is the last, last thing we need right now. So um, I'm a little bit concerned about the evaluation methods here because they are not clear yet. Uh, I don't know if I have to take my exams at home or all together once I return to my training center. Uh, but I am not concerned as for my education because 
Uh, we are following the schedule as planned for this year, and the, the teachers are making a great effort to explain the details, in, the content in detail to us. And we have WhatsApp groups and make lots of video conferences. So uh, it is actually very easy to reach them if, if we have questions or the task was not clear. So to sum up, I am only concerned about my evaluation methods, not for my education. And yeah, as I think the most difficult thing will be as an Argentine citizen to keep the distance with other people because yeah, Argentines are very affectionate with friends and family. We come into trust very quickly. And in fact, if you meet someone for the first time, you greet them with a kiss on the cheek and, and that's usual between colleagues or people you barely see. And, and we meet our friends with a hug and a kiss and anything else is considered rude. So um, we can also take mate as an example. Mate is our national beverage. And uh, this drink, for those who don't know, is a traditional South American infused drink, uh, traditionally drunk in social settings. And this, the thing is that we use the same straw uh, by drinking. So these things obviously have to change um, since COVID is so contagious. And it will, it will be difficult getting used to the elbow band reading, to stay six feet apart, to change our habits. And it's sad actually because our countries will, be, will also change. But I think uh, this is crucial to rethink the way we interact and focus on our well-being. That's what truly matters. Very much. I, I really liked um, I liked two very important points you, you raised. One about the social pressure or the pressure that exists on uh, you know about productivity and achievement and this constant learning. I think young people, people with families, etc., experience this pressure in different ways, but it is certainly there. Um, the assumption almost being that somehow we have more time, which is not always the case. Uh, or that we are willing to learn under the current circumstances. And I like your point about mate, because I think in each one of our countries, there are traditions which, um, which we'll need to either be put on hold or which we will need to rethink. Um, where we live, we also have the social kiss, you know, two kisses on the cheek when you first meet someone. Um, in Australia, where I'm from, we hug. Uh, it's hard to let go of those habits, and, uh, and it's hard to even away from a person. So thank you very much, Camila, for your contribution. We'll now go to Europe and we will go to France. And um, I would like Yassine to speak. Uh, we have um, Yassine Badou from Veolia. You're an apprentice, if I, if I understand right. And uh, I'd like you to share your experience of how COVID-19 has has affected your, your, your practical training and your, your theoretical education and your, your life. Go ahead, Yassine. Yassine? Are we still online, guys? Yes, Anya, this is Anna just coming in. I think Yasin is having trouble with the audio. You might be having, okay. okay. Well, as we wait for Yasin, why don't we go to Andrea? Is Andrea from Nestle on the line? Yes. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yes. Um, so I'm working, as you said, at Nestle as an apprentice, mm -hmm. uh, which means that I'm studying my master, my last year of master in a business school in France. And at the same time, I'm working at, at uh, Nestle um, in the category management team of the company in culinary. So this uh, 
me as many students in France, but as also everyone, I think, in France. And uh, we are uh, so in quarantine also since now a um, few weeks. And uh, so we are waiting for the government to announce us how we will go out of the uh, quarantine. Um, regarding my experience as an apprentice, um, I would say that I hadn't experienced home office before COVID-19, which is um, getting implemented in companies in France um, with the years. So I didn't experience before home office. And um, in this pandemic context, Nestlé decided to let all the head office employees to work from home. Um, so I've been really grateful when I discovered that no distinction was made um, based on the different contracts at Nestlé and that even if I was an apprentice, I could also work from home during this context and, uh, and be safe at home and not have to go to work or not be on um, technical unemployment, which could be really annoying because you cannot work and it's complicated. So I'm still working for Nestle since two months from home. And um, I would say that despite many challenges and issues that occurred for my team at work, uh, I'm really glad to see that the team spirit didn't change despite the context. Um, Regarding my manager, he's still advising me really carefully and giving me really interesting missions. So um, when I am supposed to be at a company, I'm working from home with home office. And um, when I'm supposed to be doing my studies, I'm working also with e-learning because um, my study, regarding my studies, the school also moved to e-learning. So they got adapted really quickly. And um, me as a student, I also had to be adapted because um, for instance, I still have my thesis home with the qualitative analysis to do from home, which might be a little bit complex to do, but I'm still trying to do it uh, as best as I can. So finally, I would say that COVID-19 has not been an obstacle for me during my apprenticeship, but I would say that it's a new challenge that I'm trying to handle as best as I can and um, a great opportunity to learn new ways of working, such as um, working from home, for instance. And I'm really proud to experience this uh, with Nestle that is really helping all the employees and supporting everyone. And, good experience despite the context. Thank you very much, Andre, for your contribution. You. We will now try and go back to Yassine from Veolia. Have you been able to make your microphone work? I know we had some technical issues at the beginning with the, with the app. Maybe not. Okay, we'll come back to France then. Why don't we now move on to India? And we have Vivek from Skillsonics, who is an apprentice. Yes, uh, yes. Vivek, if you could take the floor, please, and tell us your experience of doing an apprenticeship during this time in India. Thank you, Anna, ma'am. Uh, basically, I'm rep representing from the Skillsonics, India. Uh, do I am seeing you? Because my webcam is getting problem. We can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, firstly, I like like to thanks to the Salesconic and the Can Global to give them such an opportunity to speak in front of the all the countries. Basically, COVID nineteen is an virus that has come to in each and every country. Like what Melita Whitley from the Argentina said. They are due to the quarantine, the country which is facing right now. That same condition is also facing the India, also facing that same con same situation, like economic crisis, even as a losses of debt. Basically, in India, India is an uh, developing countries, like others countries. But there are the some families. 
such a condition is too bad that even one time meal they can't afford with this corona time you know as a they are the some student they can can go to the education even the people from suffering this covid 19 can get can can really can get the proper treatment due to this and due to this economic crisis I just and don't have any words to speak with with us. Uh, hello, ma'am. I can I can't get you. Vivek, has there been any? Okay. Has there been anything specific about your apprenticeship that you have not been able to complete because of the social distancing measures that are also being applied in India? Oh yeah, that have two meanings because I'm a low I'd low low to the traveling. You know, I like to. Uh, Like to feel an experience, experience to the adventure trips. And also, in my due to this quarantine, I feel that I can't go to the school. I can't go to the college. The thing I want to go, I get a knowledge from it. I think right now I'm feeling so nervous because I can't speak in front of this whole mob. It's a it's a good experience for you, Vivek. I think you are nervous for so go. many people. <laughs> I think I I can I can speak afterwards. It can be possible for you. Okay. Thank you, Vivek. Um. So what we will do now is um. Has the scene been able to connect the microphone? Can we go back to France for a bit? The scene. Okay, um, not so. Um, maybe now we'll go to Italy to Lucia Baldisseri. Uh, Lucia, would you like to take the floor and tell us how your daily routine has been affected by the coronavirus? If I understand well, you are from the epicenter of 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 the disease in in Europe, not only in Italy, and your area was the first hit um, by this by the situation. Who's yours for the next five minutes, Lucia? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm talking by Italy, and uh, as for us uh, students, we are attending classes online, following the usual timetable. Uh, that means uh, also attend uh, the practical subject, and uh, it's really hard for me and not easy. Because we are only, we can only see videos about uh, cooking and uh, yeah, that. <laughs> so it's difficult. Um, in our case, uh, we are attending the course of hospitality sector as waitress. So it is hard to practice. And instead, for me, it is more comfortable studies the other cultural subject. Uh, from my room, even if uh, is missing the direct uh, contact um, with my classmates and uh, professors. But I um, usually woke up uh, at uh, six uh, to start school uh, when um, there wasn't the coronavirus. Sorry. And now I can sleep an extra hour, so it's really good <laughs> for me. Um, due to coronavirus, most companies in Italy um, are closed, and uh, so only a small part uh, is uh, physically present at workplace, and um, this uh, is really bad because uh, our internship uh, was interrupted, so we can we can only stay at home and uh, study. That's all. <laughs> Can't hear you. Anya, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Lucia. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit, a little bit more about how your uh, personal life has been affected. Also, uh, we heard other young speakers mention that their countries are very social. The culture encourages a lot of physical contact. How has it felt being young? Given all the restrictions that have been placed on our everyday life, and especially in Italy, where they have been very strict for a very long time. 
Yeah, um, for me, it's really difficult to interact with people bef uh, because uh, usually I hug people, I kiss on the cheek. Uh, so we are really, we have really um, contact with uh, also family and parents, uh, etc. So it's really, really, really difficult for me. But uh, I know that uh, there are people that can help me, like uh, my family, like my friends, uh, and also my my professors, teacher, and uh, they can help me to pass this uh, this problem because uh, it's difficult. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, uh, but... <laughs> it's okay, Lucia, we all are. This is my first time moderating a webinar as well. I'm also nervous. Thank you very much for, um, for, for your contribution, Lucia. What we will do now is we will go now to our last young speaker, Helen Waller in the United States. She called in at 5.30 in the morning, her time. Um, she has a, a, a sort of... Um, a rather different perspective because she will speak from the perspective of someone who tried to help young people um, in employment and educational situation in dire circumstances as part of her professional life in the past and who is now experiencing some of the very difficulties that she was helping others with. So Helen, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. If you could introduce yourself first, that would be great. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Anya. So, uh, as Anya mentioned, my name is Helen Waller, um, and I am currently starting career number two, which is a surprisingly similar experience to starting career number one. Um, and so, my first six years, um, I was a high school teacher in Myanmar. And we had a, a whole semester in the student's education that was an internship experience, um, which required, you know, that all of the students write their resumes, that all of the students sometimes make cold calls, whether it was to people within companies, whether it was to older alumni that they didn't know. Um, whether it was someone that knew an expertise that they didn't have um, and walking them through that whole process um, was always very interesting. And, and in Myanmar, this was our high school focused so much on this because there really wasn't much of an internship culture. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people are, are looking at a situation similar to that right now where many companies are looking at the issue of what to do with the capacity that they even have. And so I, I think there's certainly a lot of anxiety um, as a young person, you know, of, of is there space for me? Is this how I'm going to start? Because if not in Myanmar, really what you had available was kind of what was right in front of you with your family um, or in your neighborhood. And, and thus you were very limited. Um, you were limited by your social network. Um, and your ability to reach out and, and the means that that group had. Um, and so I think uh, having internships and, and open access to them has been really important um, uh, in a variety of places for, you know, a young individual to really choose um, what they want to do. And, and it's also hard, you know, still being a teacher, my students message me all the time because now they're in undergraduate, they're undergraduate studies. And a lot of them are like, I don't know if I'm going to have a summer internship. And some of them are, some of them are, you know, in their finishing their second year, finishing their third year, and kind of that focus on the third year internship. And like that really means whether you're, people have this impression that that's really going to set what your job is. Um, and it's hard because a lot may not have that or they still don't know at what right now may look like a very late stage if that's going to be an opportunity for them and whether they're perhaps just going to have to make make an internship for themselves um, and do you know what we've seen is really challenging and just educate themselves um, get together with friends and develop some some initiative of their own um, in environments both 
physical and and mental environments that are really challenging. So um, it's and it's hard because you know the the world is changing so much, and I I wish I did have better advice for them. Um, but also, it's been fun to watch how creative they are. Um, and do things like look after themselves, just, you know, like the cooking that you had mentioned, Jerry, or um, the art that you were talking about, Camilla, that that all of their kind of little activities that normally there's like not time for have started to to creep back into their lives and add some value. Um, for myself now, um, I uh, came back from Myanmar uh, two, three years ago and started a master's in public health which in some ways was a, a very apt thing to do right now. Um, but I actually started a job before I finished my studies about seven, eight months ago. Um, and about three or four months in, I realized like, this is a lovely team, but this is not where I really need to um, end. This, this is not where I need my career to be. Um, you know, I, I definitely want something else and kind of, in January, February, started kind of thinking about reaching out and strategizing for myself on my career. Um, and then COVID-19 happened. Uh, and so in terms of where to move, how to move, do I take this time to network? Like, is it inappropriate to reach out to someone? Are they looking after a sick family member? Or maybe they're terribly bored because they don't have as much work, or maybe they're extremely busy. Um, you know, writing that into the top of an email is something I never really anticipated. Like, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I don't know how busy you are. So please gauge your response based on that. Um, you know, this kind of infringement of, of personal life into, into our professional lives. Um, and also just kind of having the, the fortitude to do any more than just my job every day. You know, I, in terms of my routine, I wake up. And I go and I make my coffee and my oatmeal and I come and I sit at my little desk, um, you know, for long hours of the day. And then, you know, it's like, do I want to sit at the same desk uh, and and network and read for more of a day? Um, and it's it's a pretty. Uh, and, and it's what we have to do with with a job search in general, but but to do it in this kind of environment. Um, there are so many other distractions when you're checking on so many friends all the time. How are you doing? Are you sick? How's your family? Can I bring you something? Can I bring you food? Um, is has has been um, a unique experience, and and I'm sure we'll look back and I'll realize that that there will be particular benefits from having done whatever it is we have to do at this time, whether that's wait, whether that's grow, whether that that's learning, um, but seeing all of that in real time has has been a challenge even for me who's presumably done this a few times uh this one this one's unique so thank you very much helen um this is yet, yet again a wonder a wonderfully unique perspective on the situation um so helen was our last uh, young speaker uh what I'd like to do is I'll just wrap up very quickly maybe the two or three main things that I pulled out from what you guys said and I guess the, the wonderful thing that I hear is that despite the very contexts um, from which you come, very different cultural backgrounds, linguistic backgrounds, the, the, you know, the, the various restriction measures that have been pay, put in place, there's something very universal to what you've just said. The need for a social life, the need for family and friends, um, some of the mental health issues that might be coming um, to the fore and that, that for which you need to find tools and the continuous pressure to either achieve or learn or succeed. It's as if though nobody's giving you guys a break. Um, so thank you very much for being so candid and for being so brave. And I know that for a lot of you, this was the first time. Um, so what we'll do now is now we will go to the mature speakers from your respective countries, and we will maybe ask them for their take on how they see what's going to happen in the space of youth employment or education in the, during the, the, the current restrictions, but also following the, the restrictions. So I will now go to Maria Constanza from Argentina again. It's early for you guys, so you get the floor first. Um, maybe if you could talk a little bit about how your government has adopted and implemented any COVID-related measures, 
um, and what is their direct or indirect impact on youth employment um, in your knowledge and in your opinion. The floor is yours, Maria Constanza. If you could just introduce yourself first and then you have five minutes. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. I am Constanza Mingola. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. I am here representing the Ministry of Labor, Employment and Social Security from Argentina. I currently work at the International Affairs Directorate, but I have also worked in the Secretary of Employment related with youth employment. So I have a, a unique perspective and this is really interesting for me because I to have the, the opportunity to hear the different situations in every country is really enriching for me. So thank you for this. As Camila and Mercedes said, uh, since March 20 here in Argentina, we have declared the social preventive and mandatory isolation. So there's only some limited activities that are essential for the support of community. The rest, we are all at home currently. And even though the, the first priority for the government was also the health of our citizens, we understood from the beginning that there are many vulnerable populations that are facing really serious difficulties in this context. So this is the case of the unemployed, those who are losing their jobs in this context, the informal workers, the self-employed, casual workers, gig workers. These are groups in which youth is very overrepresented, not only in Argentina, but in the world. So in this context, the priority for the ministry became, of course, the protection of people's jobs and incomes. This is something that we're working here in Argentina and we are defending internationally, and especially those, those most vulnerable. With this in mind, we ordered the additional payments for beneficiaries with lower incomes and reinforced the amounts for parents with minor children. This is very important for us. And we also created the extraordinary family income to cover resources for all those workers who are self-employed, who have low incomes, reaching more than 8 million people approximately, who are going to receive this beneficiary. So young people between 18 and 25 years old in here, within this universe, the 8 million people who are uh, applying for this extraordinary family income, are a majority in between the informal workers and the unemployed, in addition to having the highest poverty rates among the group of 46 to 65 years old. Uh, so this is really, if, even though this is not a measure that is oriented specifically at young people, it is very important for them and we are receiving a really high response from young people, especially for vulnerable situations. And of course, we have here a large history of working with youth, youth employ employment. And regarding these youth policies, we are doing our best efforts to keep the, the people who were already participating in the programs as active and engaged as possible. And this is really a hard situation. The Youth Employment Program from Argentina is oriented at unemployed young people between the ages of 18 to 24 with unfinished formal studies. And this program aims at helping young people who are most at risk of being left behind in, in social context, the participation in complementary activities of vocational education and training, on-the-job training, orientation, entrepreneurship courses, and labor market insertion programs. And when this pandemic started, we began to think how we were going to sustain these policies. And this was really difficult for us, especially because we needed to sustain the progress and the interest of those participants. Well, the, to mention two of the of the main uh, options for youth, for example, the first encounter of participants with the program if they work introduction course, and this is a compulsory course uh, which provides some basic skills, uh, knowledge in communication skills, digital skills, uh, knowledge about rights and obligations of workers. This is very important for us because the participants of the program come from really low income situations and they don't have many of this information. And even though we have to suspend the face-to-face -face activities, of course, uh, the employment offices began to, to think how we, they could communicate with them, how they could stay in contact. And we started to maintain the courses online via WhatsApp, via Zoom. 
to sustain the valuable bond forged between the employment offices and these young people. And another of the of these measures is the on-the-job training. Of course, this was also suspended from the beginning. And we have the particularity that, that this on-the-job training is especially for these vulnerable youth. So the stipend they receive is very important for them. We sustained this stipend for, from the beginning. And now with the fourth stage of this uh, isolation, we are starting to select some of the activities to start again really carefully and taking into account a strong protocol from prevention and care of the participants. So that's a lot of information for us to digest, but it seems like the Argentinian authorities have been very um, active, <laughs> to, to borrow a word from, from you, um, in trying to address some of the issues. And I, I, I particularly noticed you, you referred to the sort of nexus almost between informality, unemployment, the gig economy, something that's very particular to your labour market. Um, we will move on to Australia now, where we also have the gig economy and, and some young people are also in the informal sector, but that looks quite different in, in that context. Gary, I'd like to call on you now to share what the Australian government has been doing to address some of the challenges that our young people are facing um, and maybe share whether there has been a federal response or a state, um, state relevant response. I know you're based in Victoria. I'll let you introduce yourself and the floor is yours for the next five minutes, Gary. Hi, Anya. Thanks for the invitation. Um, as you said, my name's Gary Workman. I'm from the Global Apprenticeship Network in Australia. So we're one of 17 network members. Um, with that, we also um, are an industry association in Victoria. Our members employ around about 7,000 apprentices and trainees across all industry sectors. And like many of your speakers have said earlier today, um, we're certainly seeing around about 20% of our apprentices and trainees have been stood down or, or returned and currently not working. Um, but that doesn't take into account a lot of our youth in, in Victoria that have had casual jobs, certainly in tourism and hospitality, um, most of those sectors have been closed down now for about five or six weeks. So there's a lot of youth there that um, aren't necessarily captured in, in some of the government programs. Uh, the government at a federal level have started a number of programs to pay a wage subsidy to employers uh, but to be eligible for those, you had to be a full-time worker. You had to be working before the 1st of March. And in many cases, you had to be employed with that employer for, for 12 months. So, so that's good for a lot of older workers and people who have sort of established jobs, but for a lot of young people in the casual workforce, uh, they're not being picked up by a lot of those government programs at the moment. Um, so again, I think it's it's one of those scenarios that we're seeing in many parts of the world people that are in that casual workforce are the first to be put off and they in a lot of cases they'll be the last to be put back on in, into employment once the you know, the economy recovers and the restrictions around social distancing and, and everything gets lifted so we are working with the government about how we can sort of stimulate the economy in some of those areas so we can whether it's tourism or hospitality or the construction sector, how we might be able to get the, the economy in those areas working a little bit quicker and that hopefully will bring more employers into that space. We've also just about to announce a program with the Victorian government. It's a, we're calling it an out of trade register, but to support young people that have been put off their apprenticeship, um, try and understand what stage of their apprenticeship they're up to make sure that they continue their training with the training provider during this time, and then work with them actively to find a casual or a, or a vacancy of some description moving forward, and then getting them back into their formal apprenticeship as quickly as possible so they can complete that. Um, so again, that program should start in the next week or two. We're just building up an online expression of interest register, and they're waiting for the government to make sort of a formal announcement about the, the programs open. But I, I think at a, at a federal level, the government's spending a lot of money. Um, I think that one of the big risks is where, you know, I think we're adding another $250 billion to our debt. Um, that's gonna take a long time um, to pay that back. 
if we add more taxes, that will slow the economy for a longer period of time. So it's how the government reacts to you know, coming out of the, the, the restrictions, I think is gonna be key for getting young people back into jobs as quickly as possible. Um, and then at a state level, a lot of states are, are handling this differently. We've got different restrictions in different states, but I think you know the, the key areas that have been affected from, from a youth perspective is hospitality and tourism. We're also seeing a little bit in the automotive industry where car mechanics and dealerships are closing down. So there's not much work for, for mechanics. Um, and then we're also starting to see some effects in the construction sector. So a slowdown of, of those sectors are certainly meaning less jobs. Um, and again, it's how do we come around to this quickly. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, very interesting to hear about uh, the relationship between, you know, trying to help and at the same time what he does to the national economy and, and all these other considerations that we might not necessarily keep in mind um, when we think about what should be done immediately, but what are the long-term consequences of also some of the shorter term measures. So thank you very much for addressing that and also for making a particular reference to, to how the Australian uh, labor market works for young people which is which is quite different from from the other countries that we are speaking to um i would like to move on to uganda now i'd like to give the floor to vanessa who is the founder and ceo of a social enterprise called pro interns vanessa i will let you introduce yourself and i will ask you what you have been doing to address uh, during COVID 19. go ahead Thank you very, thank you very much, um, Anna. Thank you to all of the speakers that have come um, before me. Um, my name is Vanessa Atkin, as Anna has mentioned. I'm the founder of Pro Interns. Stop, which stop. Is an, um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. So Pro Interns is your lunch. with employers through internship, volunteer and training opportunities. Um, as Jerry mentioned earlier, um, in, in terms of our situation in Uganda, we have taken very strict uh, measures. So, so far we have um, 79 cases um, but zero deaths and 52 recoveries, which is, which is looking good. Um, in terms of the strict um, measures that the President has put in place, there's been you know, closure of schools, uh, borders, um, even public uh, gatherings such as churches and mosques are all closed as well. Um, because we understand, you know, um, within Uganda that our healthcare system actually can't handle the enormity of, 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 of the virus. So um, that's why we've taken strict measures, including um, a 7 p.m. curfew. And the curfew that was put in place is to um, curb uh, crime. Um, Ugandans are naturally an ex um, extremely friendly and social by nature. So these measures have affected the large majority of our population, especially the youth. 75% um, of young people are actually engaged in vulnerable work um, and work within the informal sector or are unemployed, which means low earnings and low productivity. Now, unfortunately, these young people are the hardest hit in our economy. Um, the majority of our, our population, our population is 42.2 uh, million. 77% of those um, within our population are young people, so they're under the age of 25. And those are, you know, um, the people, the vulnerable people within our population that live hand to mouth, and they're finding it really difficult during this time. Um, however, the government has taken measures to provide um, food for the uh, most vulnerable in our societies. However, um, there are some problems with, with, with these um, foodstuffs reaching um, other districts and rural areas in Uganda. Now, um, because most of the informal um, sector um, are not, of course, formally registered and they, they do not have complete books of account, unfortunately, there are no job retention or furlough schemes in relation to COVID like we have in our, um, with our Western counterparts. Um, so those who are used to having an income on a daily um, basis, it's, it's been very, very hard for them, and it's, and it's, and it's literally, you know, um, survival of the fittest at the moment. 
Um, so um, we have to see, I guess, where, where we have another address later on this evening by the president to understand what further measures will be taken in place um, in regarding um, that. Um, employees um, within the private se sector have adapted to working from home, which means they're conducting Zoom, Zoom team meetings and keeping track of you know, Slack and other online, um, other online you know, project management systems. In saying that, it's still very challenging for those who rely on internet connection from the office um, or where data is becoming too expensive and, of course, working home from home with their families. From a recruitment perspective, hiring um, has slowed down because of COVID, and, and this will inevitably have an, a, a knock-on effect on entry-level talent, you know, that being interns and apprentices and so on and so forth. So um, um, what you'll find is that um, post-COVID, a lot of companies will pause on hiring um, just to understand the economic impact of their businesses and experience um, pro-interns um, within the past month to um, hire candidates um, for their companies. They have also kind of paused, they, they have hired the um, candidate, but kind of paused on providing that particular employee with any project per se, just to understand how this will affect their businesses. Um, um, I guess what's interesting to see moving forward is how the private um, and public um, sectors and, and, and policymakers can work together to identify what skills are needed moving forward so that we can kind of feed this into our academia and our educational institutions. Um, um, COVID's um, impact will definitely ha has definitely had an impact on our tourism sector, um, tourism and hospitality sectors. And for us, tourism is a major driver of employment, uh, foreign exchange, and investment. So it'll be interesting to see how we, we will recover those um, particular industries after COVID. Um, I've seen a few conversations online about how Ugandans, you know, up post COVID can start uh, traveling, you know, domestically, traveling within Uganda so that we can try and rebuild um, our tourism sector, as you know, a lot of people globally will be afraid to kind of travel abroad. Um, for those who have, um, for those who are privileged and do have access to, say, for example, um, um, internet connection data, um, we encourage young people to learn skills online through, you know, you, um, YouTube, or um, attending online webinars. Um, also, Harvard University has a string of um, free online courses as well as Acumen. So we're encouraging young people to still try and, if they can, if they have the capacity to, because of course, everything that's happening at the moment can take a lot um, of strain on, on individuals mentally. But, you know, trying to utilize this time to upskill themselves and use the resources available to them. Um, I guess moving forward for, um, for pro interns, it'd be interesting for us to understand, which we'll be sending out a survey to a majority of the private and public sector employers in Uganda, to understand what do internships and entry level roles look like moving forward for them. Are companies still going to go ahead with their internship programs and schemes this year, or will that be kind of put on hold until 2021? Um, and then um, I guess lastly, it's also about um, paying it forward. So for those of us who um, do have the means to, how can we help those who are um, vulnerable in our societies? How can we help, you know, the market ladies who now have um, a lot of stock on their hands but are not getting enough revenue in because people don't have disposable income or aren't able to actually visit the market store? So it's also looking at what little things can we do within our society to help those who are less um, vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, I appreciate you. You gave us a lot of information and, and, very, and varied information. Your point about paying it forward at, at the very end, I think that's, a, that's almost like a call to action and it's inspirational and there are different ways in which we can do that in our, in our contexts. Um, I also appreciate your mentioning of mental health because a couple of our speakers mentioned that and I think it's something that's going to require quite a lot of attention. Um, not just in the immediate future, but also when restrictions are lifted and people have to sort of find their footing again. Um, thank you again, Vanessa. I will move on to India now. Um, so we will now call on our speaker, um, Pushkaraj, who is a trainer at Skillsonics. 
Pushkaraj, if maybe you could mention how you have been trying to adapt your schedule to the, to the students' new schedules and to the restrictions that you're all facing um, in India at the moment. The floor is yours for the next five minutes. Please don't um, forget to introduce yourself and give a bit more detail about your work. Yeah, good. From Spilsonics, India, and uh, I am a techni technical trainer, a mechanical engineer. Um, so actually, we are having different trainings uh, which uh, we carry out in India. So this COVID uh, virus, which has uh, uh, highly impacted all the countries, it's uh, slowly surging and it's increasing in India. Now, mostly all the companies and all medium and small scale industries are shut down due to this impact. Only the pharmaceuticals and food processing are running. Uh, all the boundaries have been sealed. Uh, the villages, cities, now they are converted into different color zones like red, orange and all. And accordingly, the less uh, affected zones are set free now. But uh, the red zones are uh, under uh, means uh, high surveillance. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, actually, we were having mostly practical trainings in uh, uh, daily sessions. But uh, due to this, uh, as we were not prepared for uh, some digital trainings, and uh, within some means a small uh, amount of time or uh, within an instance we had to change from a practical training to a uh, virtual training or a digital training which has uh, a lot of impact to deliver things that is uh, we had now we are like uh, searching for different uh, platforms like some simulators and all so that we can cope up with the trainings the other uh, uh, problem which we are facing is the network issue as being uh, highly popular uh, now the means uh, there is a huge increase in data usage and phone uh, usage Due to which uh, the bandwidth has been reduced, and uh, we are uh, facing a big challenge into digital trainings. Uh, now, government is taking some action against uh, violating the rules, and also it has uh, made some provisions or adapted some measures that uh, the small scale and the small uh, medium scale industries. They can cope up uh, during this uh, lockdown. Actually, they are being closed since one and a half month. They are doing some financial aids so that uh, they can pay to the employees. Uh, some some companies have been closed or started closing down, due to which uh, there is uh, there will be a rise into unemployment. Like uh, many shop floor workers or contract workers, they are now jobless. So <clears throat> uh, they are being provided with some government help, like food and all. But uh, it is uh, in minimal quantity. Uh, <clears throat> now some social organizations, they are also into it. And uh, they are I mean, so arranging food and shelter for uh, Many cities have now started to uh, reduce the population by uh, relocating them. Like uh, the Pune city, they are planning to relocate nearly 21,000 families out of Pune so that they will be out of danger. So these measures are uh, <clears throat> been taken by the government. Are some measures uh, which I say, and uh, now <clears throat> hope uh, it uh, means uh, it will uh, get over soon and will be back to work. And have uh, means uh, the main thing is that uh, we are uh, now cut down from social life. 
Okay, not able to meet anyone. And they are bored in the house, like we are seeing the same faces every day. And uh, means, uh, so many people are like, in the morning they go for groceries, afternoon they go for medicine, they are just trying and uh, <clears throat> find the ways to move out of their houses and meet some friends and all. Now, very much. Thank you very much, Pushkarash. It was great to hear, well, great to hear. It was interesting to hear your perspective. I, in particular, took note of, of the challenges that trainers and teachers um, have had to face with going um, with virtual learning or virtual teaching. I, I guess it's a, it's a skill in and of itself, let alone the technology and the internet connection and whatnot. It's also the availability of hardware among the students and the way that we need to uh, adapt our teaching techniques and materials to an online environment. I think that themselves most prepared have found that it was, a, it was an unsurmountable challenge in some cases and, and we see many cancelling, you know, uh, end of year examinations and, and whatnot because simply they were not able to, to make the switch that quickly and that effectively. Thank you very much, Pushkaraj. I'd just like to check, do we have Thibaut from Medef on the line, from France? No response. Okay, I think we might have lost um, Thibaut. Okay, in this case, I will move back to Italy. So we go back to the epicenter, uh, the European at least epicenter of COVID, where, where a lot of um, headaches started. Uh, I will give the floor now to Giorgia Guarda, who is a teacher at a professional school in Vicenza, in Italy. Um, Giorgia, if you could please um, give us your uh, take on how you've been uh, dealing with COVID-19, how you've been able to look after your students, um, how has your teaching uh, changed, and uh, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Please don't forget to introduce yourself in more detail. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am a professor. I'm teaching uh, in marketing. My students. Uh, our schools. Our school is quite big because we have uh, 600 uh, of students, and they are dealing with a path of uh, the tourism, but also electrician, mechanics, uh, and graphic. So in our school, we um, had uh, uh, at the moment uh, 400 students that are in internship. But you know, uh, we have uh, an interruption for emergency, and so it was be crazy to uh, dealing with uh, this situation because we had to. Uh, speak to all the, um, the firm, uh, all the bars and restaurants and so on, and also to the family. Uh, because in the um, um, in initial period was not clear what we have to do, as I think uh, uh, in your country, so it was a little bit hard to manage this moment, but we do, we did, sorry. So um, now the school, the school is closed. Uh, it's two months that we are uh, dealing with the, the web lesson that before, say, Lucia. Uh, we were the first uh, uh, school uh, in our region in the north. Um, we are in Veneto and we were the first school that um, introduced this online um, uh, online lesson, uh, we use the Zoom platform. Uh, it's quite easy for the student and for us because we it is quite similar to to this one actually. Um, and um, I mean, it's very hard to to have a lesson by web because. Sometimes it's not the webcam on, so you can see uh, students. Uh, oh, sorry, can I go to the bathroom? Yeah, you can go to the bathroom. Then, oh, my microphone don't go, don't work well. So it was like be crazy uh, to manage twenty five people in the same time uh, and have a lesson. I'm teaching a 
marketing. So for me, it's quite easy. But uh, my colleague uh, that have to teach a bartender or chef or culinary sector or electrician, it's more difficult because they have four hours uh, and they have to speak four hours. They have to, uh, I mean, show videos for a lot of uh, time. Um, that we so hard also because we are a practical school. So uh, it's, it's quite hard. Um, but there is also um, a positive side because uh, I discovered a lot of my students that usually in, uh, at school, uh, in class was alone and now they, they, they feel comfortable, maybe because there is a distance and also there is not the possibility uh, for uh, uh, the other student to interrupt them. Um, so I discovered that people, uh, because um, they join us more than uh, they used. Uh, also because we can also um, participate in uh, uh, this kind of uh, initiative. So it's the technology change and we are trying to change uh, to in this moment. Um, as a professor uh, in the future, I would like to combine uh, both methods. For example, in the morning, have a lesson at the school because it's very important uh, the relationship to speak uh, face to face, uh, as we say before. Uh, but in the afternoon, maybe um, it will be easy to stay at home and uh, um, have a lesson at home. Um, also, because um, uh, we are using apps. Uh, or website that we can use at school because um, um, it's quite impossible to have a 26 uh, uh, computer uh, for, for our students. I mean, a lot of uh, device. Um, so we hope uh, that in September we, we can start face-to-face uh, -face our lesson but it's not sure. Uh, we, uh, for sure, we don't uh, go to school in this month. And maybe I say uh, we can have a lesson face to face in September, but um, it's not sure uh, in this moment. Um, I'm very worried for my student in, because I feel that they are um uh, they are uh, alone and uh, previously uh, they are alone too because they stay, they spend a lot of time on video games on the net on facebook on instagram but right now they spend a double time and i think that it will be a hard part of our uh, job to um, to, uh, in, to, to try to, um, um, to catch our students and uh, to catch uh, and uh, to transmit the, the importance of the relations, the relationship with, between um, the person. Because missing the sports, uh, something like that, they are stay uh, every time and a lot of part of it the internet. So. Grazie mille Giorgia, thank you very much. Okay, um, a lot of observations that only a teacher could have made, I think, are very astute when it comes to the behavior of the students. Um, I might add, a, a, I think from all of this, from, from the whole discussion, what's coming through, especially for the, the embodied experience, the lived experience of what's happening is that we are social animals and that technology is helpful and it does connect us. I mean, this is a great example of how technology can bring so many of us from really five corners of the world together onto a screen, but we do crave the, the, the touch, the, 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 the human warmth that can only maybe 
um, take place when we are close to each other and there are no barriers. Uh, I have an anecdote for you. I have a small daughter, she's four years old and she had her first online dance lesson a couple of days ago. Her teacher sent her a recording. So it was interesting to see because at first she was excited. Oh yes, I get to use the computer. I get to have a screen, this is going to be fun. Then she started speaking to the teacher and she wanted to have some answers. And at the end of the lesson, she said, well, she just started crying. She said, I only really want to see my teacher and my friends. So the excitement of the class actually became a, almost a source of sadness for her because it reminded her of the fact that she can't see anybody at the moment. And, uh, and she's a digital native, um, uh, as we would call them nowadays. I would like to thank everybody. We have been very strict on timekeeping because we really wanted all the people who came online to speak, to have the opportunity to speak. It has been a wonderful experience moderating this. Thank you so much, everyone, for being so well prepared and so professional and so respectful. What we will do is we will reach out to all of you who are our speakers. contents of this webinar. We will come back to you for comments, maybe for quotes. We would like to put something online in the next couple of weeks, possibly, possibly with sound bites where the, where the recording was of good quality. Um, and I, we really will look at things like uh, this, the social aspect, the social life, the mental health, um, the challenges around virtual teaching, especially when it comes to practical schools. The, the different ways in which countries have been struggling sometimes to respond to, to, to the pandemic um, and being able to do so really within, within the framework of their own economic realities, which are you know, better for some than, than others. Um, but there has been, from what I can tell, no lack of commitment to young people who really are our future um, today and tomorrow. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, we look forward to the next one next time uh, and please uh, watch your mailboxes to uh, for some content that we would be asking you to comment on. Goodbye from Switzerland. Um, take care. All the best. Uh, thank you very much.